this presentation is a little bit of training on what we call rolling wave planning. Um, similar to perhaps if you have any experience with Agile, it's what they call Agile planning or sprint planning. It's along, along those lines. And it's really the last piece of the process in terms of, um, you know, we plan our work up front and we begin to uh, execute our projects and we have daily huddles to uncover um, daily impediments to the project and resolve those blockages and those types of things. And the rolling wave planning piece is, is, is another uh, process. It's, it's another piece of the process. And I, I just want to you know, take a little bit of time to explain what we mean by it and what we need to do and how often. So let me proceed here. Without further ado, in a traditional um, project management life cycle. What we basically do is we, we have these different processes where we have some uh, project initiation processes and then some planning processes and execution process and some closing out the project type process and monitoring, you know, controlling type processes, et cetera. The, the point is, is that as you can see this, this region in green, the planning process, that's generally where, where we're creating the, the work breakdown structure and defining the activities and estimating you know, who's going to do what and for how long and all those types of things. In a traditional environment, that's a very, it's very front loaded. That, that effort is largely done up front um, when we don't know necessarily everything that, that needs to be done in the project. And we may do a little bit more updating of the project plan th throughout the project, but generally our project plans become out of date and less and less useful over time. And we're you know, big fans of having not just plans for the sake of having plans, of course, we want to have good plans which are useful and, and help us to reach the objectives in a, in a timely manner. So, let me uh, just kind of keep that in mind, and let's talk about um, you know what would happen if you were if you were going to go on a journey and you were going to set sail from L.A. to Hong Kong, and you and your objective was to get there in the least amount of time uh, possible. You would you would chart the most direct path, and you would take your bearing and you would set sail. And what would be the likelihood that you would reach reach Hong Kong if you never touch the, the wheel again. Extremely unlikely. Extremely unlikely, yeah, probably zero. I mean, <laughs> the winds and the currents are gonna take us off course. And as they take us off course, we're going to monitor where we are and we're going to course correct along the way. And we'll just assume that we kind of have this haphazard, you know, back and forth type of uh, uh, path. And if you look at if you look at the deviations from that path, these little black lines represent the deviations from the optimal path. Wouldn't our goal really be to minimize those deviations if we were trying to get there in the least amount of time possible? Sure. Yeah, sure. How would how 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 do we do that? You know, how do ships manage to get there in the least amount of time possible? Constantly monitor. Right, you can constantly monitor right where they are. <laughs> right, so it's a, um, a you know real time monitoring of where we are relative to where we're going, is is a very short feedback loop. You know, we go back to our control systems, you know, theories, and we know that if we have short feedback, we probably have less noise in the system, and we perhaps uh, minimize you know these deviations in the system, et cetera. So that's that's what we do. It's really really boils down to that. Just getting feedback faster allows us to course correct more often, which allows us to you know, get there sooner. So, how does that relate to our projects? Well, we we plan what we're going to do to the best that we can, and then the project happens. Right? We fail a test, or the supplier can't who we thought could actually produce this part can't produce the part within the specs that we need or whatever. But, you know, life happens. That's the point. So we have great intentions, but we're going to learn along the way and all kinds of things are going to happen. They're going to try to 
eh, sort of derail the project. And if we're not careful, we'll, we may never get there, or it just may take a very, very long time. So we're trying to get feedback faster. That's really, really at the heart of it. So if you look at what Agile does, you know, this, this Agile project management, they basically talk about having iterations, and in each iteration is, you know, time boxed, usually. I mean, these are like something like two week long iterations or four week long iterations or something like that. And you basically plan what you're going to do in that iteration shortly before executing. You don't try to plan it all up front and then, you know, pull from the backlog as you, as you get there. You plan and then do, and then you plan and then you do, and then you plan and then you do, and it looks like a rolling wave. Ah, so that's where the same basic term rolling wave planning uh, comes from. Um, if you don't know, PMBOK is the project management body of knowledge. So, you know, that's a uh, accredited group and you can get your project management uh, accreditation through PMBOK. Anyway, so they, they encourage, encouraging, you know, encourage planning throughout the, the entire project, not just at the beginning and, and little points along the way. And so this idea, certainly applies to, we can use this in, in hardware development. It's not exactly a one for one, but it's the same, it's the same concept. You know, we can plan what we're doing in the near term with greater act, with greater level of accuracy. Uh, the farther out we go, we, we know we need to do some verification tests. We don't know exactly what it's all going to look like up front. We just know we're gonna have that phase. And so we'll put it into our project plan. And as we get closer to it, then we, then we you know, plan it out in, in greater amount of detail. And that's the whole sort of concept of rolling wave. And there's some great benefits of this um, and probably more than what I've captured here, but a few things are it helps us to keep the priorities correct. And what I'm using as my litmus test for are our prior priorities correct, are we working on the right thing at the right time is the criticality of the task. And so if, if my plan gets out of date, the criticality may be out of date. If criticality is out of date, then I may think I'm working on the right thing, but really I'm not. I'm working on the wrong thing. So it all comes down to having a, a pretty good plan and keeping that plan up to date and accurate. Otherwise, it's just garbage in, garbage out. So that helps us to ensure that we're working on the right things at the right time. Uh, number two is it helps us to really have much better visibility as far as where where are we really on the project because the uh, milestone dates are going to be updating as we're updating our plan so we can really see better where we're at how much is work is remaining which gives us a better ability to predict when we're going to get there um, also you know agile is all about teams you know it's it's not just like the project manager's project it's everybody's project. We own the project. We're all participating in the project. So this helps to keep everybody engaged and accountable too, sure. And at number four, the at the very heart of it, it's about getting the feedback faster. If we don't keep things up to date, we really don't know where we are. We're out in the waters in the middle of the ocean, but we really don't know exactly where we are relative to our goal. So it helps us to keep uh, focused on the, the objectives of the project and, you know, it's sort of going back into planning mode. You know, where are we now? And wh where do we need to go in the next four weeks or so? So it's helping to keep the team, you know, focused and also cognizant of where we might be able to avoid unnecessary delays. Okay. Um, part of this in, in, is that the level of detail over time changes. Like, so it's important to have a, a high level plan. You know, we, we need some kind of high level plan, which uh, helps us to sort of see roughly how long it's gonna take us to, to sort of do this project. But it would, be, it would be kind of ridiculous, if you will, to try to plan out the whole project in a lot of detail. And I mentioned in the training a week or two ago that, that you know, project managers love having detail if, if they would have some help updating the actual um, schedule because when you have more detail, you actually get a much better 
um, estimate of how long really things will take and you have a much better understanding of really what needs to be done and you know which resources need to do it and you can plan plan much better so you have a you have a lot more um, information to to uh, at your fingertip okay but but trying to trying to manage that is is fairly difficult and it takes a lot of time to kind of put a high level initial plan in um, a high, I'm sorry, it takes a lot of time and effort to put a detailed level plan out to the end of the project in place up front. So you, you, you don't bother. You just basically put a high level plan in place. Big buckets. Okay. We're going to do a design phase and we're going to have, you know, verification tests and we're going to have, you know, et cetera. So some, something like that, maybe a little bit uh, more detailed than, than maybe that level, you know, but sort of just enough to, to get a good feel about about roughly how long this project uh, we would expect to actually take. And of course, we'd identify perhaps what the key milestones uh, you know, during that uh, throughout the project are. And then, um, and Agile does the same sort of basic thing. Then you plan in detail uh, what you're going to do next. So there's, there's a de detailed plan for the next iteration, for the next time box. And then beyond that, you have some kind of outline, something that has a little bit more detail um, than just a tr traditional placeholder that's in the high-level plan. But you don't try to you don't try to put it in the same amount of detail as you would your next iteration. And you just go through and you revise things throughout the project. So at the end of iteration one, you then go and you do your detailed plan on iteration two, and you have your outline for iteration three. And at the end of iteration two, you have a detailed plan for iteration three and an outline for iteration four, and you continue to update your high-level plan as, as you go. Okay, so same, same idea. I mean, using a rolling wave planning is very much the same thing, since we're just doing it in a slightly different environment where we don't have iterations. We we have we have uh, hardware that may be uh, procured, and, and that hardware may take 12 weeks, and it may span two or three iterations. So so they don't really fit into the same uh, iteration bucket, you know, quite as nicely. But it's it's time based. You know, that's the point. Um, part of this too is uh, that you know updating plans take takes effort so uh, the more tasks we have the longer it takes to to update everything and so that's actually one reason to, to sort of keep the overall task count for the entire project down you know you only plan that next time time frame four weeks six weeks that next iteration in more detail so you and, and part of that is to also then to uh, keep keep the plan more manageable and uh, easier to easier to update and maintain. So let's compare and contrast huddles and rolling wave planning. Huddles is the whole. It's the that's the every day we look at the trees. It's very tactical in nature. You know, we're looking at the tree that's in front of us, and we're asking, is there a tree in your way? Because <laughs> if there's a tree in your way, we want to know. We want to know. You know, what's the nature of the block? What can we do to help? You know, etc. So it's it's about keeping the flow of the project smooth consistent, um, keeping everybody in the know, you know, et cetera, right? That's, that's, the, that's the nature of it. No information's more than 24 hours old, you know, so it's, it's a fast feedback loop. Um, rolling wave planning is usually every five days, and it's the time to look up from the trees and look at the forest. You know, where are we in the forest? Are we even on track relative to our overall goals? Because we've been looking at all these, you know, the next tree and in front of us. So rolling wave planning is very strategic in nature, usually looking out, let's say four weeks, something like that. So it's looking out four weeks, putting the, the planning hat back on, looking at our plans. Uh, our plans are naturally going to change, updating the plans, making sure everyone's aligned with what needs to be done, You know, what are the common goals for the next four weeks, Who's going to be doing what? You know, where do we hope to actually get? What are we trying to accomplish in this next uh, four-week time frame? And I just 
say down there at the bottom, most teams don't bother having a a uh, daily huddle on the day of the project team meeting, you know, because you're going to be talking about the, the project plan anyway. So there's one opportunity to save a little bit of time anyway. Has anybody seen uh, Franklin Covey's four quadrants? Franklin Covey. <laughs> yeah. Ron Covey. Yeah. Um, so the idea here is you've got on the on the y-axis things that are important, and things that aren't necessarily important, and then on the x-axis things that are urgent and not necessarily urgent. And so quadrant one, the upper left, where things are important and urgent, whoops, that tends to be our um, that tends to be where we spend most of our time. Um, of course, one example of putting out a fire is a great example. Of course, there's urgency. But the urgency is appropriate. A lot of times what happens is people manufacture urgency you know, or they manufacture importance. And it, so it, things become quadrant one all the time that maybe don't, that maybe, you know, shouldn't be quadrant one. Of course, this is a, a, a proper example of something that is, you know, a quadrant one activity. So we're going to put the fire out. There's urgency. It's important. We need to, you know, do a good job on it. In our in our daily life, these these should be the critical tasks. So the the pink tasks um, aren't. We're not trying to manufacture urgency. We're, we're trying to say this is something that does have urgency simply because it's on the critical path. Just keep in mind, all of the work is important. It's just that some are more likely to cause a a, a delay to the you know project, and others are less likely. So we're just differentiating between those and we're establishing urgency based on that which is pink and that which is not. But I want to make it really clear that just because something's critical doesn't mean you try to hurry up and get it done fast. Okay, I mean, it's great if you can get it done fast, but, but that's, you know, we don't want to make mistakes that are avoidable. We don't want to create any unnecessary rework on the critical path. Every critical task we want to do, we want to do it right the first time, if at all possible. It's kind of like fighting the fire. We don't want to just sort of kind of put the fire out, right? We want to put it out. We need to do a really good job, make sure it's out, okay? So in, the reason that I mention this is I've seen a lot of uh, different environments where people, when they're on the critical path, they're like, oh, I got to hurry up and get it done. And they do kind of a, you know, not as good of a job as they should, creating rework. And that rework costs us more time, and that we, we want to avoid that. In fact, it's all about everyone making sure that that, that that critical person has everything they need, that what they have is complete and accurate, that if we want to have really make sure we have another person check their work, you know, and just really make sure best we can that that work is done uh, completely and accurately to the best of our uh, team's ability. Um, where we do manufacture some urgency is around the daily huddle. Uh, they're important, you know, it's really important to make sure we're on, that we're communicating and finding these blocks and we're better managing the outcome of the project. So it's important. The reason I say we, we tend to manufacture some urgency here is because we want to keep them to 15 minutes or less. And uh, most teams, once they're kind of up past the you know initial uh, learning curve, they basically say at you know 15 minutes we're we're done whether we're really done or not we're done. So it's got to keep on track during the meeting and you know make make good use of our time. Okay, so quadrant two is what uh, Covey calls the the, uh, the, uh, the the quality time. This is the quadrant where we invest. And we invest to, you know, to get something in return, something greater than our, uh, something that pays us back more, more than that, than our investment. So, I live in the mountains, to do a lot of uh, chain sawing, and if you never sharpen your chain or replace it, eventually your productivity just goes pretty much to nil. You know, you're not, you're not going to cut a whole lot of wood. You've got to take care of your equipment. We do the same thing on the production floor. We schedule preventive maintenance all, all the time. But there's no urgency there. There's only urgency there if the 
machine breaks down, then we have urgency. And then, but that was avoidable. So we're trying to avoid being in, in a quadrant one where it's avoidable. Same example with the car, right? We change the oil, we do those things because we don't want, in my case, I don't want my wife to be on her way to wherever and have the car break down because that puts me in quadrant one. Uh, I don't want to be there. I don't want to be there. Okay, so exercise is another example. It just there's no urgency there. We have to we have to just kind of do it. It's good for us. We know that. You know, uh, make it part of our our uh, life habit. You know, etc. So in the work world, it's the yellow tasks. You know, they don't really have urgency. They're not supposed to because they have extra slack on them. And in fact, everyone needs some slack in their lives. That's that's a good thing. Okay, but it okay, we have to differentiate what really does have slack and really what's on the critical path, and and manage manage you know between those things appropriately. Well, the last thing that falls into this quadrant is planning. And there's no urgency, you know, or very little. Maybe up front. Well, we we gotta we gotta get our plan in place. We gotta get going. But generally, we like to do. You know, the plan, do, check, act. We we're engineers. We like to do things. We don't want to. I didn't get into this to to you know send meetings to plan what we're going to do. I just want to begin doing. I like doing. It's fun. Well, planning helps us to ensure we're doing the right things <laughs> at the right time. So that's it has a lot of lot of value. You know, um, but everything basically in that quadrant requires some discipline. Anyway, uh, in the third quadrant, and the last two, I'll just kind of round them out. But it's things that where sometimes we, we feel there may be urgency. Sometimes the urgency is appropriate. Sometimes there's urgency. You know, there's urgency because I get a pop-up. That's the urgency. So I tend to respond to this thing popping up. You know, it used to be in the old days, because I'm kind of an old guy, the phone would ring and there was no caller ID. And so there was urgency. What you know? What do you do? Not answer it? Well, no, you answer it because it might be important. So that's that's what I mean. You know, so having this pop up from your email, this is an opportunity to just you know turn it off. Don't don't do it. Just focus during the mornings on you know that which is most important. Work on your project tasks, and then turn your email on later, or at least leave this little pop up you know notification off, because it tends to create urgency. And you're constantly trying to check, which is a form of a distraction, which is basically a, creates switching costs and blah, blah, blah. Anyway, so some phone calls and emails. And of course, our last quadrant is, is, is the veg time. Yeah, great. Main thing with this is the, the quadrant two things all require discipline. And the planning is no different. The rolling wave planning is no different. Having the daily huddles kind of falls in there, but the rolling wave planning really falls into this category. We have to find a way to structure some discipline in the organization in order to ensure that we're doing it. Because we'd rather just be, you know, doing, right? Why, why, why bother planning? So, in the spirit of that, um, what we what we do, the only way that I've really found as a fairly effective way to to uh, to get this to become part of your normal behavior is is to create a task. Whether we call it the rolling wave planning task or update plans task or something like that. But basically it gets scheduled for everybody once a week. You know, it's an individual task. So it's a it's a big copy paste operation from now until the end of the project. But the idea is it's a reminder that hey we we're asking you to take a little time to prep for what we would call the project team meeting, which is part of the rolling wave planning process. But kind of like doing your daily task updates at the end of the day to prepare for tomorrow's daily huddle, you know, you have to spend a little bit of time thinking about your your piece, your portion of the plans before you walk into the planning meeting, into the project team uh, meeting. And so if we create a task, it's a reminder and it tends to get consumed because you're all kind of in the flow of, of consuming things, marking things, you know, complete. So if it's there, it, it must be reasonably important. So that's, you're going to begin to see those. I, I, I put a copy down for everybody for Friday just for the experience of it. Okay, that's that's all. Um, 
I don't want you to feel like I'm pushing things on you. It's the only thing I'm going to push. That's the only thing. And so really, this rolling away planning process is kind of broken down into two, two parts. Part A is the preparation that everybody does, which is consuming that task. And it's just making sure that your plans are up to date in preparation for the, for the team meeting. And this really, if you're, if you're doing it with a regular cadence, like weekly, shouldn't take very long. You know, it may only take 10 or 15 minutes. You need to go through your your plans, put on your planning hat for you know ten minutes or so, and et cetera. You know, do do the following. But it's like like cleaning your house. If you never do it, and you're going to only do it once every six months, it's going to be a lot more work. And uh, yeah, so that's that's the nature of it. And then really part B, which is usually on on a different day, it's usually on the very next day, uh, but it could be in the afternoon of the same day, or whatever. You know. You'll you'll find what works you know for you, but that's when a team, generally a project team, comes together to look at their plan and the health of their project, looking for the next quote unquote iteration, usually the next four weeks or so, and and we'll you know go over some guidelines there as well. So as part as the as no 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 as <laughs> The, the preparation piece, um, I'd say each person, any any person who is assigned a task, we're just asking them first and foremost to just go through and look look through your all your different tasks on all your different projects. You can use the backlog. It's a nice kind of convenient way to sort of highlight everything. In this case, you would look at every task, you know, not just the queued ones, but the ones that are planned to uh, begin, but they may not be actionable yet. They may not be queued. May not have the fill dot on them yet. And what I say is, you know, drag them forward in time to your best estimate for when you think you are likely to start them. Not not just to the current day, not just to next Monday. We want to give it a little more thought than than that. So this task here, this layout prototype task down here in the plan. It's what we call out of date in the plan. And the reason we call it out of date is because it's, it's projected start date, you know, when it was planned to begin was February 8th. Maybe that is the first day of it. Well, now it's February 14th. So this is in the past and we haven't, we haven't started it yet. It's not scheduled. So it's, it's out of date in the plan. It, it must be at least on the current day or some day in the future and rather than well so probably what you'll ask for is why doesn't it just move these things you know forward automatically yep it's a great question and I can tell you every customer has made that request and we were getting ready to, to code that and make it happen and, and I'm not saying we we're not going to we we may but uh, the more experienced customers then eventually came back and said, I'm glad that it's not automatic because we actually need to think through it. It really involves more thought than just blindly moving all the work to the next day. If you move all the work just blindly to the next day, it's like just creating a bigger pile of work for that person on, on the next day. So, you know, they go from having six or eight hours of work on the next day to having 80 hours over time on the next day. And that's not a realistic plan either. So really there's a little more of thought that, that kind of goes into how, how do you update these things? It's kind of like, you know, to like a lot of things like having a automatic, um, well, yeah, I have some, you know, I have a background as a mechanical engineer. So everyone says, well, we want auto dimensioning on the drawings. You know, well, yeah. But how? What's the likelihood that the CAD tool is really going to know what your design intent is? I mean, it can't really. You have to build your design intent in for the auto dimension to sort of work. You know, um, same thing with like routing, routing on a PCB. Um, there's just there's just more involved than, than what meets the eye. So, so part of what I want to say is why is it so important to try to kind of keep these things quote unquote up to date in the plan and not out of date in the plan? What, how much slack does this task have, this layout task? Uh, yeah, we don't know. Okay. 
Well, so I'm, I'm hearing a lot of a lot of people respond, but I can't I can't quite hear anybody. So, does it have zero days of slack? No. 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 Does it have one no. to five days of? Slack? No. No. No, right. So it's got more than five days because it's yellow. Yeah. So assuming it's tied to a major milestone, we know that it's got more than uh, five days. Well, that's that's true, um, but the, the slack is based on its projected start date here in the past. So in reality, when we move that forward, that's when it updates the slack calculation. If we move it far enough uh, forward it may turn orange it may turn pink you know I don't know because I'm but it's that's part of why it's so important to to move these things forward based on what you have on your plate and and your relative priorities and if you are uh, begin moving things you know forward and they begin to turn pink and this is really realistically when you think you can begin this task on this project relative to the tasks on your other project, this is a really good opportunity to bring this up to, let's say, Al or Kevin's attention. This is important. We need to talk about this. I need help. You guys have to help me sort out my, my project priorities, you know, because uh, this is becoming, you know, critical, et cetera. Maybe we can hand off to somebody else, you know, et cetera, et cetera. So, so mm -hmm. moving, them, moving them out, and can't, kind of keeping them up to date based on what what you what what blah, blah, with what each of us feel is most important right now for us to be working on 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 our different projects is is actually really uh, informative and important. So so that's kind of number one, and and we'll go over it. By the way, what what I'll say is what I'm going to you know show you looks like looks like a lot of work. Um, it's not really it, when when you sit down and do it for real. And you sort of see what we're talking about, especially if you're keep keeping it up to date, you know, regularly. It's really not very much work. Uh, it's more a discussion around uh, near-term objectives for the for the project, and do we have that captured in our plan? Is the plan accurate? Is it valid? You know, six weeks ago we began doing some uh, you know planning, or eight weeks ago, or whenever. Well, things are going to change as we go, and we're going to have some. We're going to learn some things. We're going to have new risks. We're, we may need to plan how we're going to mitigate those new risks. Uh, but our plan is going to become out of date, and so we need to challenge the assumptions that we had, you know, in the past. And we need to go through and think about what's coming up in the next four weeks or so, and we need to update the plan. Yeah, so. This is that opportunity. This is that time that we carve out to say, put on the planning hat and you know figure out what it is that we we need to do in the plan to bring it up to date and, and accurate. And so I'll also mention that uh, when possible, we've been capturing what we call a a uh, summary task owner. So for here, this prototype power board, you know, gray summary task down here in the plan. John's the owner, so. So John, as a summary task owner, has some additional responsibilities. You know, he's he's sort of on the hook to make sure that his portion and you know, everything in his you know summary task is as up to date and accurate as possible before before the planning meeting. We don't want to walk into the planning meeting, which will only be an hour long. I'm, I mean, the uh, team meeting usually is like an hour long meeting. We don't want to walk in there and then try to make all these updates. Uh, we won't. We won't. We won't get as far as we could, and we won't be thinking as strategically as we you know, probably should be. So that's why we want everyone to you know, do a little bit of updates in advance. But I don't need to really go through and, and update out to the end of the project for everything we have. You know, I'd say at least for the next four weeks. Some teams say it should be for the next six or for the next eight, something. You'll, you'll figure out what what time horizon works best, you know, for you. It depends a bit on the nature of the projects and how long the projects are and maybe the complexity of the projects, et cetera. But, you know, that's the general gist. Some quote unquote next iteration or week time frame, something like that. And then um, like I was saying, you know, at first 
if you want to have some visibility for like a 18 month project, you, you want to have some visibility to how long this project will take and what the quote unquote schedule looks like, you're very likely going to have placeholders for tasks, V and V, you know, 12 weeks. It's, it's just a placeholder. It's out there in the future. We're not going to plan all the detail up front. It's, it's kind of, it's really kind of too early. We just know it's usually going to take some some amount of time, and over time we'll learn and we'll 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 get better at our predictions. But when these things, when these big placeholders begin to fall, not in the four weeks, but they start getting close to the four week time horizon, then we start you know, planning them into more detail. We start preparing ourselves. And making sure that uh, that our plan is up to date and accurate, and we really understand what the what the details are. So, uh, this example has it showing in the four weeks. I'd say it's probably more like six, eight, ten weeks out. You know, you just looking down the road, kind of like driving a car. You know, when I was taught to drive a car, I was taught you look uh, how many seconds past the hood of the car, all the time, four seconds or whatever, constantly, right? What's happening right here in front of me? And then every so often, every 10 seconds or so, you're supposed to look up farther down the road to see what may be um, happening that may have some kind of impact on you. There's an accident forming or whatever, you know, same idea. We're looking at the near term. We look up a little bit, look a little farther out. Farther and farther out, we don't really worry about quite yet, you know. It's far enough down the road, we don't, we, we don't really need to worry about it yet. That's, that's the idea of rolling weight planning. So basically, if you're um, you you want to do these things right here, you know, you want to do these things right here to basically make sure that your piece of the, the plan is up to date and accurate before you walk into the into the team meeting, kind of at a high level. And then you get uh, a gold star if you do this. <laughs> if you if you check your you, your utilization. And I'll, I'll show you how to do this here uh, in a few minutes inside a playbook. So, so basically the idea here is this is like looking at how much work is there on my plate for the next X number of weeks across all these different projects. How much is planned for me? Am I overloaded? Because if I'm overloaded, then we don't have very realistic plans unless I'm going to clone myself somehow or unless we can hand some of that work off to somebody else uh, or if we can reduce the scope or if we can, you know, but there's a lot of or if we can't. And generally, we we operate in this environment with really not ever knowing or acknowledging that our system may be overloaded. Therefore, we don't really have realistic plans. So let's just assume here that this, this is all critical work for, for this individual and they're overloaded. That what that really means is our timeline is artificially too short. If there's if we can't hand it off to somebody else, if you know if it's got to be me, and then really it's going to take me longer. So whether I just acknowledge that now, and we have a more realistic plan and a more realistic end date, um, or if we just let it happen and quote unquote we're late, we're late, we're late, we're delayed, we're delayed, you know, so it's sort of proactive or reactive. Uh, so this is you know fitting into that equation. So we want to see where where possible overloads might be, and if if you run it, you know don't don't necessarily rely on somebody else to sort of do all this. It only takes a couple of minutes, and just just have just just have a look at it. And notice I have a red line there that says five hours. Uh, what do you think that represents? Average. Yeah, your average availability to do project work. Yeah, so you know, maybe five, maybe six. For some people, it might be two. If you're Al, it's probably one. You know, um, certain people maybe it's six or seven. You know, but we're going to measure that over time. If 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 uh, if everyone uh, continues to sort of track where your time goes, I'll be able to tell you what everyone's availability is with much greater accuracy after a month of using playbook. So that we're not assuming, you know, so many things. But in general, it's not. We we know it's not eight. So if I look and I see this is the the load on this individual, and this is a a, a weekly load, 
So this is week one, this is week two, week three, four, you know, et cetera. The, the places where it turns down, you know, those are weekends. And so um, I can see this person's overloaded. They've got too much work on their plate. So I have to, I have to try to find where that, where that work is, what project is it in, uh, can I hand any of that off to somebody else, you know, et cetera. But most, at least, at least you're aware of it. What's that? Mostly they're overloaded because they're taking the weekends off. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Oh. yeah. Did, I, I'm sure. I'm sure you. I'm sure you know this, but you can get uh, 40 hours of work done on the weekend and get eight, eight hours of sleep. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But that's not the environment that we want to be in, right? Come on. Anyway, yeah. Okay, so that's that, that's kind of what everyone does in, in uh, preparation. Then part B is, hey, you know, uh, weekly. Some teams do it bi-weekly, but usually no longer than than that. You know, we we have uh, we have a team meeting. You know, and what we're what we're focused on in this team meeting. This is not really a technical meeting. This is really a project-related meeting. It's more of a project management type you know meeting. It's is the project healthy? Where are we? Are, are we healthy? Are we running behind? Are we on track? You know, um, we'll talk about how we know that here in a moment. If we're not healthy, how do we how do we look? How do we get back on track? You know, what can we do? If we are healthy, let's make sure we understand clearly what's coming up in the in the near future to make sure we stay healthy. <laughs> yeah, right. That's the idea. Make sure we're all prepared. And then last but not least, we check to make sure that our near-term plan is accurate, up-to-date, <clears throat> if people have made changes or are going to propose changes, we discuss those things here as, as a team. And we make sure we're all, you know, we're all on, on the same page. But generally, it's not, not a discussion in real detail of what we did in the past. We're not trying to review a, each and every task in the plan, and it's not, it's not focused on technical type things. So yes, of course, at some point you have to have technical oriented meetings. Well, of course, but, but this is really not, you know, that meeting. Now, if you wanted to say, well, we're going to kind of combine those things and we'll have one meeting in which we talk about uh, project health, we talk about uh, project risk management, we talk about uh, technical conversations, oh, that's fine, but you need to budget more time and you need to probably try to have a, a firm agenda. You know, because we all know that it's very, really easy to to talk, you know, technical just um, because we like talking technical. You know, that's that's the nature of it. So how do we answer the question, is the project healthy? Well, one of the things that we'll do on Thursday is we'll begin to set up some buffer charts. We'll set up some buffers, which will drive a whole, you know, conversation. <clears throat> and we'll set up a, a chart for each of the buffers. <clears throat> Pardon me. And that will help us to to um, assess are are we healthy or not. So the charts basically, as you can see, broken up into you know three regions: green, yellow, red. Green is healthy. Green is low risk. We're on track. Really not worried about missing our quote unquote deadline. At yellow, we're at some elevated level of risk. When we're we're in the red, <clears throat> we're at a higher level of risk. It doesn't mean we're necessarily going to be late or miss our deadline. It just means that we're at a higher probability, you know, of missing our deadline. Fewer things could go wrong and we'll end up causing, you know, having or experiencing additional delays that will uh, cause us to end up being late, quote unquote late. Okay. So what we do is we look from, from like for the last week, if, if it's been the last week, we look, we're looking at, well, how did our buffer consumption, what happened in the last week? And if we say sharp inclines or we start burning a lot of buffer, we need to understand what's the cause, what's happening, right? You know, and it's, I think it's important that the team understands what's happening um, because the team is going to help to f figure out what maybe we can do to get back on track. So understanding what the nature of the cause of the delay can be very um, informative, very useful. So, so this meeting in part is where are we at and do we have any sharp inclines? How are we trending? 
You know, we expect to use most, if not all, of the buffer. That's what we expect. But if we use it too fast, we're at an elevated level of risk of missing our deadline, and that's what we want to avoid. Some things that cause delays may be things that are going to happen uh, on all projects. So understanding what those causes are may um, help us to learn and to better manage other projects as well. Some causes of delays we just don't want to repeat on this project. Maybe we have another buying cycle or whatever it might be that caused that one. We want to make sure it doesn't happen you know, in the next iteration um, on this project either, you know, that we, that we better manage it. So then we have a little conversation around how do we get, how do we get back to being, being healthy. Now, you're not going to see these things change. We're not, we're not going to have a dip. We're not going to regain buffer. So in this case, what this means here is that our uh, milestone that we're tracking is 20-some 20, 20 days, 22 days um, to the right of the start of the buffer. It, you know, it's moved up 22 days, quote, unquote, into the buffer. Uh, on the next day, it moved back down uh, 10 days. So we did something on the next day that allowed us to regain some time. What would some examples be? Well, usually if it's that quick of a turnaround, it's we decided to expedite something. We paid an extra $5,000 to expedite that order, and that was a four-week lead time, and we just cut it down to two weeks. So maybe that's what, what we did. Sometimes we'll see it kind of come back down, but gradually, more slowly. Um, and that might be, well, we've figured out that we're very likely to end up having more delays if we don't get another pair of hands in the X group, you know, to help us out, whatever that is, mechanical, electrical, software, tech, whatever it is, right? We just realized we got a big chunk of work coming up. We're going to need to get more resources on it to help us out. That usually takes some time because you don't usually just get people into the project and they're helping you out immediately, you know, right away. Uh, depends on the nature of the work. So, but that's what we're looking for. We're looking at the plan and we're like, uh-oh, we're using our buffer too quickly. Let's look forward in the plan. Anybody got any ideas about how we might save some time? Is there any work that we can cut? Maybe we had a bunch of uh, risk mitigation and we decide that we're going to have to go at a little. Yeah, I don't like that way neither. But but sometimes we might change the, the uh, scope of the work that we're gonna, going to do. Uh, we may offload work to other people in another pair of hands. That could be could be an external party, you know, hire some contractors, could be. And I'm sure there's other things that we might, uh, you know, look at as ways that we might regain some, some time. Um, but that's what, that's what this meeting is all about, having that conversation. Last but not least, you'll see on here, it says rebuffer the project. And yeah, that's, that's always an option. Well, we'll just add more time to our buffer. That sounds great. I love that idea. The problem is, is when we get into the, into the buffer training, what you're going to learn is basically this, everything in playbook is pretty fluid, right? You know, this is going to change. That'll change. That'll grow a day. That'll shrink a day, blah, blah, blah. Except for the end of the buffer. Once we, once we establish a buffer, we enter into, that's where we enter into our agreement uh, with, with the business. And so changing it usually has to go through some kind of formal process within the organization to, to change it. We're, even though in playbook we could change it, we're just not going to you know, allow, be allowed necessarily to change it at will. What else do we do? We review the project plan. Now, on the, on the projects that I've seen for you guys, you, you probably could review each and every task because you know, they're fairly small scope projects. Um, probably on... Got a lot more moving parts, a lot more things, you know, a lot of tasks, a lot of parallel paths. Probably not going to have time to review everything. Probably don't need to. You know, we need to kind of have the summary task owners understand uh, enough about project management to, to better manage their piece of the plan. But what we're going to mainly focus on is the critical activities. You know, we're going to look in at the critical, near critical paths. We want to review those first 
We want to make sure those are up to date and accurate. We want to find ideas for ways we can maybe save time on the critical path without necessarily incurring any unnecessary risk. You know, but we want to bring those ideas to the table. Um, and then at the end of the meeting, we want to make sure everyone's that what we're trying to accomplish in the next four weeks, those goals are clear and that everyone's got fairly clear priorities. And you know, those those kind of go hand in hand. Uh, clear goals, clear priorities. Um, and also we check, we just make sure that that there's no big batch, big chunks that those placeholder activities have been broken down into smaller things at this point. And so that would be, it, there's just that check that that's been done. Okay. And that's, and that's it. Uh, as far as, as far as what rolling wave planning is kind of what we're looking to actually do.